Today's webcast is hosted by the Eastern Lake Ontario Swallowart Collaborative, or ELOSC, a stakeholder-driven network that links people, information, and action through enhanced communication. The ELOSC serves as a platform where different stakeholder groups can share research and best management practices to enhance the management and spread prevention of swallowwort. Current ELOSC collaborators are shown on this slide and any stakeholder organization that embraces this effort is invited to become a collaborator. Joining the ELOSC is quite informal, informal, no papers to sign, just a willingness to share information please contact Robert Smith to collaborate. <clears throat> this webcast is designed to provide an overview of biological control research being done to control swallowwort, one of the Northeast's more aggressive invasive species. We will hear from four guest speakers involved in swallowwort biocontrol research, and we will conclude the webcast with an open discussion where our presenters will answer your questions. Our first speaker today is Dr. Lisa Tewksbury, who received their bachelor degree in plant science and PhD in environmental science from the University of Rhode Island and her MS degree in entomology from the University of Delaware. Dr. Tewksbury has worked at the University of Rhode Island for over 36 years and is currently the director of the Biocontrol Lab. The lab conducts research and implementation of biocontrol agents of invasive weeds, including swallowwort, phragmites, and Japanese knotweed. Dr. Tewksbury will give an update on releases of Ipena opulenta conducted for management of invasive swallowwort by the University of Rhode Island Biocontrol Lab, Connecticut and Massachusetts since 2017. I'd like to inv invite Dr. Tewksbury to now share their screen the floor is now yours. Thank you, Megan. Okay. Are you able to see that okay? Um, I'm not seeing your screen quite yet. You are not. Okay. There's a share screen button on the bottom. I already, I already hit it, yeah. That's my screen, right? So. I just see your face. Is anybody else seeing um, a, a screen? No. Hmm. <clears throat> it's okay, take your time. I just, I'm hitting the button, it's not doing anything. So. Hmm. I don't know what to do other than who oh is Eric doing. says that they see it so maybe I'm just not seeing it someone is seeing a photo I do not okay so strange all right I see your presentations gone uh, presentation or how's that excellent I'm okay. seeing it now <laughs> thanks for your help <laughs> yeah no problem sorry about that <laughs> that's okay Okay, so I think maybe I'm going first, partly for the historical perspective. Um, as you heard, I've um, been at the University of Rhode Island for over 36 years and probably working on swallowwort, or at least I was aware of swallowwort in the late 90s. So it has been quite a while. Um, so um, Megan gave you a good intro, but this is the University of Rhode Island Biological Control Lab. It's a small um, containment facility attached to our greenhouse and that enables us to do some of the foreign exploration required in classical biological control and that was built in uh, 1994. So as I said in the late 90s uh, there was a um, land manager in Jamestown, Rhode Island who was seeing this plant and it asked a colleague of mine you know what it was to identify it and up until that point um, I hadn't heard anything about it and um, I think it was a few years later that I actually um, wrote a paper for a biological control class on the potential for biocontrol of um, swallowers. And now that I'm teaching the class, I'm having um, my students write similar papers on other projects. But this gradually um, morphed into a um, chapter and then um, many grant applications. And then a um, graduate student started working on this in 2005, um, Aaron Weed. 
Uh, so this is just to point out that we actually have two different species of swallowers that are invasive in the US. And um, the one that we have in Rhode Island is primarily the one on the left uh, with the deep purple flowers that's referred to as black swallowwort. And um, Connecticut, um, New York, Canada mainly have the one on the right, which is referred to as pale swallowwort. And um, we've been using the European um, genus name Vincitoxicum, but quite a few people in the US use Cynancum. So um, they're both um, you know, synonyms. This is Watson Farm, where it was pointed out to us. And uh, this is a pasture where they um, graze animals. And so it was quite a problem because of the animals don't feed on it. And so at this um, historical farm right by um, the Jamestown Bridge, uh, they, you know, they really were having difficulty controlling this. And this is, I'll be referring to um, Charlestown or South Farm Preserve. This is another pasture. This one is used more for recreation than actually for farming. They would like to, um, you know, when they mow it, use the hay, but they haven't been able to in a number of years. So again, um, many of you are aware of, um, you know, this invasive plant and that it is related to milkweeds. It's in the family of Apocynaceae. It has similar um, pods, though they're a bit smaller. Um, it can cause, you know, pretty large monocultures similar to the photos I showed you. Um, if you look at photos in some areas of New York, um, you know, they're even much larger fields, much larger monocultures than what um, we have here in Rhode Island. Um, they are toxic to livestock, similarly to milkweeds, they have glycoalkaloids. Um, and then one of the things that we had an, an additional graduate student work on was we had found monarch females laying eggs on swallowworts. And um, in the research that our student did, they were able to uh, see about 20 to 25% of the eggs of a female might be laid on um, swallowwort instead of milkweed if the two plants were growing in the same pasture or under some of our um, field cage experimental conditions. So in 2005, um, Aaron Weed came to us and um, started looking into the project that I had um, envisioned, you know, as a, as a student in a class and um, was able with Dick Hesse to get funded to do his um, PhD research here on swallowwort biocontrol. So the initial exploration took him to CABI in Switzerland and took him to a number of sites in Europe where he eventually found a total of five insects. Um, I'm not going to go into all of that, but it took a number of years for him to work through the biology and with other students, the uh, host range testing. Um, we ended up focusing, or he ended up focusing on his um, research on these two moths that had been collected. Um, and the others were either difficult to rear or um, the um, host range testing sort of eliminated them very quickly. Um, Hypena opulenta is the one that rose to the surface a little bit. Um, it had been collected by Aaron in um, southeastern Ukraine, and it was collected in this wooded ravine area, which is a bit different from the types of areas where we find swallowwort. Ours are mainly in pastures. Um, we do still have swallowwort along the field edges, but um, you know, this, this was a little bit different. And at this point, when he found this insect, the insect had been named, had been identified, but the host plant was unknown up to this point. Um, over a period of, you know, working with the insect, Aaron, um, you know, determined the life cycle was about five to six weeks at 20 C, um, a little bit higher when we rear it um, at 25 C in the lab has five instars. Um, that's a picture of the fifth in the center. Can have multiple generations a year. That's one of the things we'll talk about in a little bit. Um, and overwinters as pupae in the leaf litter or the soil. And uh, this is in the family Arebidae. <clears throat> and um, same, similar pictures um, summarizing this information. Um, the host range testing did show that the hosts are restricted to the genus Vincitoxicum. So um, with 
our petition for release, it ended up taking a number of years. Um, the petition was submitted at the end of 2011 or beginning of 2012. Um, the technical advisory group for weed biocontrol approved um, the petition in uh, 2013. And um, Canada was able to then rear this insect and make releases in 2014. Um, for the US, we had to go through a num another process through um, USDA PPQ, which also goes through Fish and Wildlife. And our first releases uh, were able to be made um, starting in 2017. Um, just to give you a little bit of a review of um, the host um, specificity or the test plant list that we used, we ended up getting um, our list approved by the technical advisory group uh, with 79 species. And because it's in the same family um, as milkweed, um, we tested 48 species of Apocynaceae. Um, there were a few rare species that we tried to um, you know, locate, but weren't uh, unable to. And then we, um, because we were working with um, Abrostella and Hypena, we looked at other related insects and what plants they fed on. And that's how we added the urticaceae or the stinging nettles. And one of the other five, uh, one of the five insects that Aaron brought back was um, uh, Chrysolina beetle and they feed on Artemisia species. So there's kind of a guideline on how to choose these plants. And these are just a couple of the um, ways that we chose these 79. So to, uh, to summarize, you know, um, we did test a Brostola, um, the other moth, and it also was specific to the genus Spincidoxicum, but um, we determined to, to go with a petition for release just for one insect at a time. And so um, we have not um, continued with a Brostola um, since. Um, so the Hypena opulenta larval host range is restric restricted to the genus Spincidoxicum, and um, both the pale and the black swallow were, um, are, you know, um, suitable hosts for the for this species. Um, Hypena can have multiple generations a year. The larvae do target young foliage, um, and it has a high reproductive output. So once we got our permit, um, we had already planned since 2012 to make releases um, because most of our swallowwort is in the um, sun and Hypena opulenta was collected from the shade, that was one of the first questions we wanted to answer was, is this insect going to be of value at all in um, open pasture areas? And so in the um, August to September of 2017, we did release um, larvae this time in these large field cages on the Shawn Island in Massachusetts and um, one cage was set up in the shade, another cage was set up in the sun. Um, we also did a similar setup in 2017 in Charlestown, Rhode Island. Um, so these are the two um, that I had shown you the photos of early on. Um, we ended up setting up a third cage um, so that we ended up having part sun, full sun and shade. And this really did confirm what we had thought and that the um, uh, the black line there uh, with the shade cage had high um, uh, damage to the leaves. The larvae did well, there was a lot of feeding damage um, and the part sun didn't do quite as well, um, but the full sun, the red line at the bottom, um, you know, we never got more than about 30% um, um, defoliation. So in 2019, uh, another thing that happened, I'm sorry, um, in 2018, we again released larvae and we had high mortality. 2018 was a very um, hot and humid year. And so in 2019, we decided to release adults instead of larvae. And um, we also were trying to make earlier releases because this, um, you know, the timing of this insect works better earlier in the season. And we've been finding that out um, each year after releasing. Um, we removed the cages after about three weeks, which gives time for the adults to lay eggs, um, the larvae to feed and go through the um, five instars. Oh, well, actually somewhere around third or fourth instar is, is about when we um, remove the cage. And just to make sure that there's enough, um, you know, foliage for the larvae to complete development. Uh, so this is Jamestown and um, the feeding you see on the left is from the small instars. 
it's uh, called window pane feeding. And then on the right, when you start seeing actual um, feeding from the edge of the leaf, that's the, the larger in stars. So the releasing of adults worked very well. We ended up getting a lot of larvae um, developing inside the cages. And uh, this cage, we might've gone a little bit too long, um, but the larvae were still alive and moved out into the surrounding area. Um, so over the period of 2017 to 2021, we have released in these sites in Rhode Island, Connecticut, Massachusetts. Um, this is funded by uh, USDA APHIS uh, Biocontrol. And unfortunately, we've only seen successful overwintering of adults in um, South Farm Preserve. And there we have released every year since um, 2017 to 2021. Um, every other location is pretty much just a one, one time release. Um, maybe in one or two cases, we released a second year. Um, so others, uh, you'll be hearing from some of them, but others have been doing um, research on this insect and have added to the information that we can use to improve our releases to improve our timing. Um, one of the things that came out of Canada, um, Rob Bircher and Ian um, Jones, I think, um, found that the photo period um, for that larvae um, will diapause when the day length or photo period is less than um, 15 hours. And so this green box here in our area is kind of the window. And if you look at our earlier releases, um, some of them were too late in the season. They were into early July and that wouldn't allow the larvae to um, you know, continue to develop, pupate and emerge as adults. Instead, they would go into diapause. And so this does not encourage our chances for a second generation. So I have here South Farm Preserve is in Charlestown, Rhode Island. And so to have larvae um, not go into diapause and continue to develop we have to have larvae in the field somewhere in that window of June 3rd to July 10th. And then in Boston is a little larger window from the end of May uh, and a little uh, longer into July. Um, so basically um, releases in our area have to be completed by the third week of June. Uh, and maybe earlier than that is better um, if we're going to try to get um, a second generation. And um, Mariana Zutz, who's um, going to be speaking today as well, came up with this monitoring plan, which a number of us are using in the Northeast in our monitoring. Uh, initially, we were monitoring just inside the cage or just a little bit outside the cage. But as we go now into future years, we're going to be um, recording the leaves that have uh, hypena feeding damage and, um, and moving that out further into the fields. Um, we also, since we haven't seen moths emerging in many of our sites yet, we're going to be doing some uh, moth trapping at night. We started a little bit of that in the last couple of years, but we're going to expand it to more of our sites and hopefully maybe our timing um, will be a little bit better. Um, we did find a hypena uh, baltimoralis, uh, which is in our area at one of our moth trapping sites. So, and, and they've been pretty successful using this in Canada as well. Uh, so our current status is that, you know, we did confirm that um, Hypena opulenta does seem to do better in at least partly shady sites. Our adult flight is um, end of May, early June, uh, and our adult releases were much more successful than larval releases. Um, so we're going to be targeting late May to mid-June uh, from now on. And uh, we only have the overwintering of adults at this point, no actual establishment of any of our release sites. And just to throw in, um, since 2018, we've also seen a pathogen on our um, swallowworts. Uh, specifically, this site in Charlestown has been the most impacted, but pretty much every site we go to has some level of it. And it, it doesn't really start to show up till the end of June. Uh, and we have a graduate student working on this now. Um, so hopefully we'll be able to get a little bit more information going forward. And um, as I said, USDA funding for much of this and um, a number of students have helped us over the years. Many, many, many students. Thank you very much. Thank you.
Thank you very much for your presentation, Dr. Uh, Tewksbury. Our next speaker is Dr. Mariana Zooks, who is an entomologist and evolutionary ecologist trained at the University of Idaho for her PhD and Colorado State University for her postdoctoral research. Dr. Zooks joined Michigan State University as an assistant professor in 2018, where she specializes in the biological control of exotic weeds and insects. The research integrates contemporary ecological and evolutionary theory with biological control to increase establishment success and the effectiveness of biocontrol programs. Currently, they work with four invasive species in the lab, including agricultural pests, such as the brown marmalated stink bug and spotted wing dorsophilia, invasive knotweed, and swallowwort. Dr. Zooks will provide an overview of the swallowwort biocontrol research being done at Michigan State University. Welcome, Dr. Zooks. Thank you for the introduction, Megan. I will share my screen. Okay, can you see the normal mode? Yes, I can, thank mode? you. Wonderful. Okay, so, so I will focus on Michigan only, and I decided not to give a background on the moth and the swallowbird plants because I assumed others will do that for me. So thank you, Lisa, for covering that portion. So jumping into Michigan, uh, this is the distribution of uh, pale swallowbird, and on the right is black swallowbird. They occur in uh, over 27 counties in Michigan. The hotspot is here just north of and County, and that's where most of our releases uh, are concentrated as well. Just a few pictures of what these look like in Michigan. We have more of the shaded type of uh, infestations, big monocultures, uh, as you can see here in road sites as well. We do have a few pasture uh, infestations, but I would say most of them are like forest understory as you see it here. So the research I'm presenting uh, has been done by two graduate students. Uh, Brianna Aured uh, started in 2019 when our biocontrol program started here in Michigan and she already finished her master's uh, project. And these are some of the questions we are asking here in Michigan. So what is the impact of hypena in the field? how well they are synchronized with the climate in Michigan, and what factors may enable better establishment success of biological control agents in general and hypena in particular. We also are running some uh, restoration experiments to explore what methods might help restore swallowbird invasive sites. So for this first experiment I'm talking about, we were looking at the impact of the biocontrol agent. And for that, we created transplanted swallowbirds. So that was transplanted a year prior to the experiments. And then we covered them with these two by two cages and we implemented four different release treatments. So we released either one pair, two pairs or five pairs uh, in the cages of hypena adults. And we also had uh, control cages that didn't receive any moths. And all of these treatments were repeated four times and the releases took place around the summer solstice uh, at the end of June in 2019. And I would note here that a single hypena female was found to be able to lay 400 to 600 eggs. And that's how we chose these release sizes so as not to have complete defoliation of the plants if possible. And we made sure that they laid eggs before we released you know, the one pair treatment and the two pair treatments. So this is Brianna releasing the insects. This is what the swallowbird infestation in the center looks like. It's uh, climbing up uh, uh, these uh, tomato cages. We used black swallowbird for these experiments. We did see adult emergence uh, in July 2019, but only in three of the cages. And there were adults released in 12 of the cages. But when we looked at the larvae, we found larvae in more than three cages uh, later in August. So it means that even within the cage, it was hard to find the adults. So like, it's no wonder that we are missing them out in the field when we cannot even find them in a two by two cage. 
These are some pictures of complete defoliation in some cages where we released uh, five pairs. So they leave the pods, but they ate all the leaves. And again, just some of the feeding marks also that Lisa showed you. And here is one of the late in star larvae. And we are running into the same problems as uh, Lisa was mentioning. We have this uh, pathogen, which was identified by the MSU Diagnostics Lab as Circospora leaf spot. It's a fungus. We found it both in 2019 and 2020 in this experiment. And it was so bad that it actually infested almost 100% of the leaves. And uh, we think that the second generation larvae ran out of food or the food was just really bad quality because of this fungus that could have contributed to the lack of establishment. So Brianna took several measurements. Uh, she me measured you know, the stem numbers, seed pod production, and also defoliation levels. And these are the results for the defoliation levels. So this is the percent leaf area removed. And on the x-axis is the date. And these are the different treatments. So the control where no insects were released, one, two, or five pairs of insects. Early in the season after release, when the first generation larva was present, there was very little feeding that we could detect. But in the second generation, when the larvae uh, like, uh, were feeding in August and later into September, we saw defoliation levels uh, around 25, 30% in the five pair treatment and fewer or less defoliation when we released fewer insects. So that was expected uh, that uh, you know, the release size will reflect uh, the defoliation levels. And I would add here that in Canada, where there is established populations of hypena for five years, they do not see more than 25% defoliation. And in most uh, cases, in most places, they only see 1% defoliation. So the 25% they only see locally where the releases took place under cages. And so these results kind of correspond with what they see in Canada in terms of uh, how many larvae are there per plant and what damage they are causing. And I don't, uh, I'm not showing the results for the others because they were not significant. What I mean by that, that this defoliation didn't result in any different uh, seed pod production. So seed pod production was the same, whether it was five pair released or one pair released. And also the stem numbers didn't change for one year to the next, just because of one season of feeding, which is again, not uh, unusual because it was only one season of feeding. So these are the number of larvae that Brianna counted in these plots. On the y-axis is the mean number of larvae. And on the x-axis is the dates. And you see, this is the first generation larvae here. We saw very few of that. That again corresponds with results from Canada that they usually have a hard time finding the first generation larvae. And it's usually the second generation when they see more of the feeding and larger or, or higher larvae numbers. So again, obviously where we release the most insects, the five pair, that's where we saw the most larvae. But these results indicate that in Michigan, they should be able to do two generations when released around the summer solstice in late June. And again, Lisa touched on that with the uh, photo period uh, experiments that were done in Canada. So we were hoping you know, that after the second generation larva, we would see some overwintering success, but that wasn't the case. Uh, in the next year, when we went back, put the cages back on and nothing emerged. With that, I move on to the synchronization. And again, I would like to bring up this uh, graph that was uh, that's from the paper coming out of Canada. And so they are looking at, uh, you know, the photo period changes. And in Canada, they find that 50% of the hypena will go into diapause at 15 hour, 35 minute day length. And the problem is that as we go more south, we would need to release them earlier and earlier so they would be experiencing more than 15 hours of daylight. And it's not just the adults, but during larval development, they should be experiencing less than 15 hours or more than 15 hours of daylight so they wouldn't go into diapause. So what it means is that if they go to diapause, they don't produce a second generation. And then they are uh, overwintering as pupa, but they have to spend a really long time as pupa in the soil 
they are uh, prone to predation. Again, there is a recent paper coming out of Canada that actually a large uh, proportion of the hypena pupa overwintering is being eaten by rodents and birds and other things. So we don't want them to go into diapause. We want them to produce a second generation. So we did an experiment uh, at a shaded site and a sunny site. So again, the shaded site was at a natural black swallowbird infestation in the forest. It's on MSU campus, actually. And for the sunny site, we had transplanted uh, swallowbird plants uh, here at the sunny location. And we released insects at two different times. So either in June uh, 25, which is around the summer solstice in Michigan, uh, or July 17, which is actually when most of the insects become available from our rearing. So we tested these two dates. And what we found in the shade, we saw over 60% defoliation when we released in June 25, but not when we released at Ju July 17. So the earlier release was a lot more successful in terms of defoliation. And the sunny environment, they just really didn't like it. And again, that corresponds with what Lisa was saying, that they don't perform well in the sun. So they did well in the shade and the conclusion of this study, we should uh, release as early as possible and in shaded sites. So this is just one of the plots uh, from that sun and shade experiment. This is the shaded site. This is a control plot where we didn't release any insects. And this is where we released five pairs. You see almost the uh, complete defoliation of the plants. And the problem is, again, from that experiment, nothing has emerged the next year. So we put back the cages the next year, but we didn't see any emergence. So we cannot confirm overwintering success. So not just with hypena, but with most biocontrol agents, uh, there can be genetic problems with the biocontrol agents because they are in quarantine rearing for many, many generations, and uh, they can go through bottlenecks and inbreeding. They can adapt to the rearing environment. So there can be lots of things that actually make them less fit, and we want them to be as fit as possible for field releases. So we are running some experiments to explore how we could increase their fitness. And so we have our MSU laboratory colony, which was founded in 2018 by, 20, by 19 females. So we received these insects from the University of Rhode Island from Lisa's colony. And we assume that's, uh, that because of the low founding size that they are probably inbred and you know, we had uh, like, we've been rearing them uh, continuously. So they haven't experienced really you know, variable conditions or anything. But then in 2020, Lisa sent us from some insects from Canada. So she went to Canada and collected the field established uh, hypena. So the story here is that in Canada, they approved earlier hypena for release. So they started field releases in 2013 and they could confirm establishment in the field by 2015. So the ones that were collected in 2020 spent about five years in the field. We assume that they started adapting to the conditions in Canada and you know, just became more fit because they were exposed to more variable conditions and more natural conditions. So what we did is we crossed the Canadian colony with our lab colony to create this so-called outbred colony. We are assuming that this would have higher genetic diversity or maybe got some adaptation from these Canadian individuals. So in a cage experiment in the lab, uh, Brianna uh, put one female and two males on potted plants. And uh, for uh, all of these three colonies, so the MSU lab colony, Canadian colony, and outbred colony. And this experiment was replicated for each colony 12 times. And then he uh, counted how many pupa they produced and again took many other measurements that I will not be talking about, like development time and uh, emergence rates from the pupa. So the most important point here that I want to bring through is that the outbred ones, when we uh, crossed the Canadian and the lab colonies, produced almost double as many pupa. So their fecundity increased compared to the parental uh, strains that were used for the crosses. And this indicates to us that probably it's a good idea to, uh, if you want to increase their fitness, to use outbred colonies. 
So with these things in mind, uh, we also designed uh, the field releases to try to test how the genetic background might, might affect establishment success. And the other important factor is usually release size, which is again, uh, kind of uh, intuitive. So we, we used two different release size, a lower one with five pairs uh, of uh, like uh, five pairs of hypina and a higher one with 20 pairs. And we also had two genetic backgrounds. So this is our standard colony, which is the MSU colony that we had uh, since 2018 and the outbreath colony that was the outcome of the crosses of our MSU colony with the Canadian field population. And we released them at 18 sites in Oakland County. This is just uh, Detroit here. So it's uh, north of uh, Detroit. So that resulted in four treatment. We had five pairs where the genetic background was uh, standard. So inbred maybe five pairs with an outbred uh, background, a genetic background, and then 20 pairs with standard or 20 pairs with outbred backgrounds. And again, we have a full scheme of like uh, looking at uh, what kind of damage they cause and to check for establishment success, which I'm not going into right now because it's been a little disappointing. So for the releases, we used these uh, one meter by one meter cages. We released adults. We let them lay eggs and we moved the cage one to two weeks later. And this work and also the fitness experiments are being done by uh, Brianna Foster, who is my PhD student. And uh, so we saw uh, feeding and larvae uh, in the field after the releases, but later in the summer they disappeared and uh, we didn't uh, find anything the next year. So we couldn't confirm again establishment success at any of the 18 release sites. And we are trying, so it's possible they established, but the population sizes are just too low for detection. But we will uh, do new releases nevertheless in 2022. And we are planning to start earlier. Uh, we are aiming for an earlier release or like rearing and also use not just adults, but larvae and not release at one time point, but continuously through the summer has become available. So, and we will be also using again, the outbred colony and the MSU lab colony for these releases to compare high genetic uh, diversity uh, influences establishment, hopefully. And that brings me to one of the last things I wanna talk about today, and that's a restoration experiment. Again, all of these are in early stages, just one or two years in because we started the biocontrol program in 2019. So that's also being done by Brianna Foster, the, uh, the PhD student. What we have is six treatments uh, and uh, each treatment is replicated four times in a completely randomized blood design. And the four treatments or the six treatments consist of, first of all, we are digging out swallow vert. So swallow vert removal, and uh, in a four square meter area. Then we have a treatment where we remove swallow bird and then add native uh, seeds. And then we want to mimic the impact of biocontrol, assuming that they establish. So what we did for one of the treatments, we just uh, remove 50% of the foliage of the swallow bird plants and don't add seeds. And here we remove 50% of the foliage and add seeds of native species. Then we have our control where we don't touch uh, swallow words. And then we have a treatment where we don't touch swallow word, but we add native seeds in case the native plants are seed limited. So for the native seed mix, we use a mesic woodland mix because these sites are all in forest understory. And again, this experiment is still in the early stages. Uh, Brianna is looking at how the percent cover of the different species changes in the different treatments, which are on the x-axis. So he's, uh, she's recording the number of invasives or the percent uh, cover of invasive species that are other than swallowwort in the plots, then the uh, percent cover of native species, and in blue is the swallowwort density or the cover. And as you see here in all of the plots, uh, there is very few uh, native species or other invasive species than swallowwort. And swallowwort is uh, the most uh, like covered, but when you dig them out, obviously, again, that's intuitive. You have a really great reduction and uh, 
then the density of swallow bird gets closer uh, to the native seed densities or the native plant density. So what we are interested in is to see whether a single uh, act of digging them out, how long is that gonna you know, influence swallow bird density, how fast they might recover and how these other treatments you know, may work themselves out over time. So obviously this is a longer term field experiment and we didn't expect any results in one year, but again, as you probably know, when you dig them out, that's the most uh, effective method of getting rid of swallow birds, but it's not doable in most sites. These are some of the native species that are coming back in the swallow bird plots. Bottle brush, grass, and hairy wood mint uh, are some of them. So just to recap, uh, for the first question, what is the impact of hypena in the field? We did that cage experiment where we used the realistic field densities of H. opulenta that they are also seeing in Canada. Uh, in that case, larva defoliation was under 30% in most plots, and this didn't have any effect on seed production of uh, swallow words or the stem numbers of swallow words, but that was only a single generation or the single season, and we couldn't confirm overwintering success likely because of the circospora leaf spot. In terms of how well they are synchronized with the climate in Michigan, we see that two generations are possible if we release the latest around the summer solstice. So we shouldn't be releasing anything later than that. And they do perform better at shaded sites than at sunny sites, which is again was expected, but there is few confirmation from the literature. In terms of how to release the biocontrol agents to increase establishment success, uh, it appears that genetic diversity will be an important factor. At least we are seeing that the outbred colony has much higher uh, fecundity and they can produce a lot more pupa than the Canadian or the lab colonies that are not outbred. But again, we don't have confirmation of overwintering success as of 2022 spring yet. And for how to restore invaded sites, the swallow bird manual removal is the most successful on the short term but obviously we need uh, many more years of data to uh, inform what is the best method and what is doable for you know, land managers. With that, I'd like to uh, thank, uh, first of all, we are founded by the Department of Natural Resources in Michigan, by the Michigan Invasive Species Program. And uh, the two graduate students produced this data that I showed you today, and we have collaborators uh, at Colorado State University, Ruth Halfpower, and Lisa helped us a great deal, uh, teaching us how to rear these moths and providing us with the initial colony and also the Canadian uh, individuals. And Rob is a great help also, uh, giving us insights when things fail, what's going wrong. And yeah, I have to take questions after all the speakers are done. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Zeus. Our next speaker is Dr. Dylan Perry, who received their Bachelor of Science in Biology and MS in Entomology from the University of, of Alberta and PhD from Mich Michigan State University. Dr. Perry has been a professor at the State University of New York College of Environmental Science and Forestry for 20 years conducting research on invasive insects, such as the Cyrex wood moss, wood wasp and gypsy moth, biological control of forest pests and invasive plants. They also have extensive interests in the conservation of threatened insects. Dr. Perry teaches courses on biological control, the ecology and management of invasive species and insects and global change. Dr. Perry will provide an update on the New York State releases of the biocontrol agent Hypena opulenta in 2020 and 2021, and highlight some of the successes as well as challenges of establishing the species in this ongoing project. Dr. Perry, we welcome you. All right, do you see my uh, full screen? I see your present your slides, just not the full screen yet. Okay. 
now Thank I am. You. Yep. All right. Thank you, uh, everyone, and especially um, thanks for the uh, the invite to talk today. And um, also thanks to uh, both Mariana and Lisa because they've shortened my talk greatly by um, reducing uh, all the prefatory material that I originally had in it. Um, I'm going to talk about our ongoing project in New York State. And I think one of the things that to, you will notice is that there's a lot of commonality in uh, what Lisa talked about, what Mariana talked about, and what I'm going to talk about, which is really interesting given that we're looking at the same insect and the same uh, plant systems in three very different environments. So this is a, a project that I started in 2018, and it's really a project that is comprised of a team of, of different researchers. Um, Andrea Davalos and Jacqueline Schnur are plant ecologists, um, and they're looking at native plant um, abundance and diversity in our plots, as well as swallowwort demography. Uh, Carrie Brown Lima is at Cornell University. She's uh, an outreach specialist, which does a lot of our um, talking with collaborators and, and uh, handling the outreach side of things. Um, we owe a huge debt of gratitude to Lindsay Milgraf, who's sort of unfortunately phased out of, not by choice, out of um, research on uh, swallowworts, but uh, there is probably not a more knowledgeable person about swallowworts, um, perhaps anywhere than Lindsay, and he's been a really integral part of this program. And then also a special thanks to Audrey Bo, who um, is a graduate student at Cornell University, uh, has been doing some supplementary hypena releases, um, as well as kind of uh, acts as the glue to, to uh, herd the cats of all the um, PIs on this project. Um, so uh, as um, Lisa and Mariana uh, indicated, um, swallowworts have uh, been around in the US for a considerable amount of time. And um, certainly in New York since the uh, mid 1900s, and, um, you know, one of the surprising things, I think, given that how successful they are in, in individual areas, is they actually, relative to many other invasive plants, haven't really spread as far as one um, might think, given their biology. And they also tend to have kind of a patchy distribution, very, very abundant in some areas and, and um, relatively um, or occur only at moderate densities in, in other locations. So in, in New York, we actually have both species, pale swallower and black swallower. And um, pale swallower is in central and northern New York by far the most uh, abundant species. In fact, around in my part of central New York, uh, pale swallower is really all we see. There are, are a few locations where black swallowwort occurs um, west of here. But in general, what I'm gonna talk about with this project is, is uh, exclusively pale swallowwort. So there are some ecological differences between pale swallowwort and black swallowwort. Um, as Lisa indicated, uh, black swallowwort tends to be a little bit, bit more of an open um, growing species. Pale swallowwort can be incredibly successful even under a forest canopy. As long as there is some light available, um, it will do sometimes quite well. It, it's very good at taking advantage of light gaps um, and it can occur at actually quite high densities under a forest canopy. And of course, in, in full sun, uh, pale swallowwort densities in New York State are um, a sight to behold. I mean, there's some areas where the entire um, field might looks like it's composed of, of pale swallowwort. And, and some of the density and cover estimates that we've done, more than 80% of, of the cover might maybe uh, pale swallowwort. 
So in um, my project, uh, one of the things that uh, we were focusing on uh, was trying to develop a system for scaling up rearing. So one of the challenges um, with Hypena and, and, um, and rearing it is that it is um, relative to, say, for example, the um, biocontrol agent for purple loosestrife, the Gallicella beetles, Hypena is quite a challenge to rear. It's, it's finicky, it, it's quite picky about conditions, it's intolerant of, of heat and humidity. And so there's a lot of effort that goes into producing even modest amounts of insects. And so one of the things that we set out to do was to try to develop a rearing system that we could do at scale. And so um, we worked on developing an artificial diet system so that we could uh, remove the plant component of rearing from at least part of the life cycle. Uh, one of the challenges with Hypena is that the early instars will not feed on artificial diet. They, as Lisa alluded to, they have this characteristic window pane feeding, and that feeding uh, method doesn't seem to translate to um, an artificial media. So the system that we've come up with is using uh, plants to get the adults to oviposit, um, and then we uh, transfer those plants with early instars into feeding cages. And once they reach the third instar and, and start to feed openly um, from the leaf edges in, um, we switch them to an artificial diet that uh, was, is kind of an amended um, beet armyworm diet that we incorporate some swallowwort stem into as, um, as a feeding stimulant. So one of the things that did um, was it cut a significant amount of mortality in our rearing program. So originally we um, often had more than 50% of the larvae would fail to reach pupation. And um, with the switch to artificial diet, uh, we, we could get uh, rearing mortality down to around 18 to 20%, which um, is a, seems to be about as good as we can get with this system. It's still actually pretty high, um, higher than we would like, but uh, certainly it has allowed us to produce more uh, insects. So in kind of looking at the cost benefit of that, um, and you know, Lisa can attest to this or, or to talk about this uh, in the discussion session, Lisa rears entirely on foliage and has kind of an army of, of um, lab techs that assist in, in that process and, and it's very labor intensive. Um, artificial diet is also has some labor intensive components as well. So I think it's one of those damned if you do, damned if you don't kind, kinds of, of things and there's advantages to uh, each approach. Once we had uh, developed this rearing approach, then we looked at um, trying to establish Hypena in a series of plots. So we set up 10 pale swallowwort infested plots um, across central New York. And these plots represent really three different habitats. Um, we have some open field sites, we have some forest understory sites, and then because the project was funded by New York State Department of Transportation, we also incorporate, incorporated some highway rights of way. At each one of these sites, we did a full native plant inventory. Um, and then we also did a whole series of swallowwort um, measurements and metrics uh, so that we could have a uh, benchmark for swallowwort abundance and dominance and seed production at the beginning of the project. And hopefully uh, down the road, we'll have something to refer back to if we successfully establish the insect. 
So in both 2020 and 2021, we did field releases into these cages. We did both first generation um, releases and we did second genera generation releases as well. Um, for first generation releases, we used um, the moth release approach. Um, we did this by taking newly emerged moths in the, in the lab, um, putting them into cages uh, with no number of females, no number of males, uh, provisioning them with, with water and, and honey. And um, after two to three days, we then transferred these individual moths to the field. Now we're using six by six by six field cages. I think they're a little bigger than what Mariana was using. And they're the same cages that uh, Lisa was using. And so we were using densities of 30 males and 30 females in both 20 and, uh, 2020 and 2021. For second gener generation releases, we used larvae. Um, it was harder to synchronously generate enough moss to do this consistently for all 10 sites uh, in the second generation. Um, and so we resorted to using uh, larvae, uh, generally um, fourth and, and fifth instar caterpillars. These were not released into cages. These were released at point, various points um, around where the uh, cage was situated. So outcomes uh, 2020, um, we actually had some really significant affiliation in some cages. Uh, in fact, in, in several at several sites, we ended up lifting the edges of the cages so that caterpillars uh, would not run out of food and, and were able to disperse out into the surrounding um, habitat. Uh, in the bottom corner, um, this is uh, one of our forest plots at, at Wells College. And I've uh, put the outline of the cage there um, after the cage has been removed. And you can actually see that there is a pretty extensive defoliation of the swallow work, both where the cage um, perimeter was and then well, out, well outside. So uh, some of these cages are producing a lot of, of caterpillars. So after the first generation, um, we were able to observe adults um, actually both in the cages uh, and, as well as we had some observations of adults um, flying uh, when they were disturbed in the, in the surrounding um, foliage. So um, a couple of things of note in 2020, we actually had um, significant feeding damage in all habitat types. So both open field, um, forest sites, and right away sites. The open field ones were actually pretty impressive because um, one of the sites that was um, heavily defoliated was actually in full sun in a really, really dry and hot location. And it was actually the site that I predicted that would have the least success and was kind of satisfied to be wrong in that particular case. So in 2021, um, we, were, we repeated the uh, protocol and the releases using moth releases in the cages for the first generation and then caterpillar releases for the second generation. Um, we were not quite as successful in 2021. Um, our, our number of sites where we had significant defoliation was, was fewer, and we actually seem to have a lot more uh, variation. Uh, one possible explanation for this is that 2020 and 2021 were about as different um, climatically as, as you could get between two years. Um, 2020 was a significant drought. Uh, 2021 was the, I believe in the Syracuse area, was, was the wettest or second wettest July in history. So very, very different years, um, which may have contributed to some of this um, variation between um, the two years. This is just a, a summary of um, the overall defoliation 
in uh, the cages for generation one in 2020 and 2021. Uh, you can see in general, 2020, we had pretty significant uh, defoliation in, in all of the cages, um, more variable in, in 2021. And then in uh, 2020 and 2021 with larval releases, of course, um, much lower levels of defoliation. And really the, the less than 10% is, is just an estimate. Many of, the, many of the sites you could barely detect any damage at all. And the figure I show on the side actually sort of illustrates how variable um, the uh, success of hypena is. So these are, are two cages. Uh, similar habitats, releases done at the same time, um, and these pictures were taken on the same day. One site, complete defoliation, the other site, very, very moderate feeding. So there is something going on uh, at individual sites that that is limiting the success of, of hypena. We don't know what that is yet. It could be biotic, it could be um, more uh, predators at a particular site. Um, some of our sites, we had a lot of ant um, activity. In fact, they were really, when we did adult releases, the ants were consuming a lot of our honey water. Um, so we know that, that ants were very prevalent at some of those sites. And ants, of course, could function as predators of small larvae or eggs. Um, there may be, site-to-site -site variation in abiotic conditions as well. Um, this is something that we're, we'll be following up in some future research. So um, I am sort of, as a scientist, I'm a skeptic and, uh, and uh, tend to be pessimistic, but in 2021, um, we were able to detect uh, hypena feeding damage uh, in the proximity of four of our sites. And this is prior to any releases in 2021. So this is the uh, result of pupae that successfully overwintered, moths emerged, laid eggs, and produced caterpillars that were feeding. And so the top figure, you can see um, some feeding damage. And in the bottom figure, uh, that is our detection of a caterpillar um, about 15 meters from um, one of our previous year's release sites. And uh, we actually found two larvae at that site. Um, one of the interesting things is that the caterpillars were not detected as part of any kind of formal uh, transects. So we did all these time consuming transects trying to uh, determine the presence of caterpillars and we never found any. And two of my undergraduates were actually packing up for the day and walking out of the site and found two caterpillars on the side of the trail. So it was sort of fortuitous, but um, it does indicate that they uh, had successfully overwintered, um, made and laid eggs and produced another generation the following year, which is, um, which is optimistic. Um, so some of the limitations uh, that we've run into, um, some of the things uh, Lisa and, and Mariana have already touched on, but one of the challenges, uh, especially in New York with our extremely high density of swallowwort that often extends for acres and acres, is it's very, very difficult and will continue to be very difficult to detect uh, feeding damage or larvae. Um, in the case of the, the Canadian populations and surveys that uh, um, Lisa and, and Mariana referred to earlier, those uh, releases were done uh, along hedgerows in, um, in the uh, Ottawa uh, experimental farm area. And the feeding damage and um, distribution of hypena is very constrained um, and it's relatively easy to do, do transects and, and detect either caterpillars or uh, feeding damage, um, which is definitely not the case for us. 
So um, as both Mariana and Lisa alluded to, um, we have not had a lot of success in the US in terms of um, conclusive uh, establishment. Um, I'd like to think that we're sort of, you know, what we found this year uh, at my sites sort of got us par at least partially on the way, certainly a reason to be optimistic, but until, um, you know, we get some more years, years of this, um, I'm not willing to, to yet say that we have um, successfully established uh, Hypena in New York. So um, should we be pessimistic or optimistic? Um, I guess that depends on who you are and, and, and what your outlook is. Um, I do think that the Canadians have given us some reason to um, be at least somewhat optimistic. So um, as uh, Marianne and Lisa uh, indicated, the Canadians had quite a head start on us because of their um, willingness to permit the releases. And so um, the map here shows the original release site on the uh, Ottawa Experimental Farm. And uh, the stars actually indicate areas where they were able to detect um, hypena feeding uh, at various time intervals after the original release. And you can see that they have um, moved considerable distances and actually even crossed a, a very large and busy uh, highway interchange um, and established another uh, uh, site. So they're certainly capable of overwintering and uh, uh, a pretty inhospitable climate. My sister lives in Ottawa. I know Ottawa's climate very well. Um, the uh, Canadians actually released relatively few insects. So uh, over a two-year period, they released just under 2,000 um, larvae and got successful establishment. And um, you can see from the, the figure that, that uh, was in um, Rob Borchet's uh, paper that came out in 2019. Um, even though there's not a large percentage of leaf area being eaten, uh, the trends are in the, in the right direction and um, they're consistently able to detect feeding damage and, um, and insects. So there is some reason to be optimistic. Um, there are also some some real challenges to the using hypena as a biological control agent. So um, just some of the, the, the challenges, which uh, recap some of what I've already talked about, they are a difficult insect to rear in large quantities. Um, and that's, a, that's a, a challenge for distributing insects to other people. I get innumerable calls from all sorts of people in New York State that are anxiously awaiting for shipments of hypena and I have to tamp that down and tell them that I barely have enough to stock my own plots, let alone um, do wide scale releases. So that's something that we're gonna have to overcome. As uh, Mariana nicely indicated um, with her figure, there are, there are some challenges with um, day length and where you can actually have two generations of hypena. And one of the, the big underlying challenges for that is that day length is a fixed property of latitude, but spring phenology varies tremendously. And so in some years, um, swallowwort may actually be coming out of the ground two or three weeks later than it does in other years. And that's going to be uh, a challenge for the insect and, and certainly a challenge for releasing uh, successfully. Uh, Mariana also uh, alluded to a, a paper that, that just came out where they quantified some overwintering mortality of pupae in the field in an experimental study, and it was pretty significant. Um, a, a large portion of uh, pupae were being consumed by either invertebrate predators or vertebrate predators. Uh, as well as some indication of not surviving um, cold temperatures. One of the 
uh, or another aspect of hypena that is challenging is that um, it is an insect that probably does not occur at very high densities in its natural range. It has a uh, ecology that suggests that it's probably relatively solitary. Females fly, lay, lay an egg, fly somewhere else, lay another egg. And so, um, you know, it may never actually reach the kinds of densities that are required to have a significant impact on, on swallow work fitness. Um, it clearly has an affinity for shaded locations uh, where we found our feeding damage and where we found our caterpillars were both partially shaded. Um, the Canadian populations seem to be almost exclusively in partially shaded or shaded areas. And as both Lisa and Mariana showed with their figures, um, caged uh, caterpillars uh, do let, tend to do less well in um, full sunlight. Uh, I was really pleased to see that Mariana is working on the um, genetic aspects of hypena. One of the challenges is that the original colony stemmed from relatively few insects. 36 individuals were collected. Um, all of our breeding colonies, uh, including the Canadian colony, are descendants of that, those original, original collections. And even though different populations have been separated for some time, they, they started with the same amount of, um, of uh, genetic material. And so there is likely uh, almost certainly a, a, a founder effect. And um, we really, you know, it'd be really advantageous to get more individuals from um, perhaps different parts of its range to kind of bolster that genetic diversity. Unfortunately, um, that's not going to happen anytime soon. Um, some of you may be familiar with, with uh, this uh, location um, because it is rather prominent in the news um, these days. The uh, two points that I've marked there are the original collection locations for Hypena opulenta. And I can tell you that uh, an excursion to the Mariupol area anytime soon is probably not something that's going to, to happen. So for now, at least, we are um, stuck with the Hypena that we have. And that is what we're going to have to uh, work with going forward. Um, so just a few acknowledgments. Uh, in addition to the, to the people that I acknowledged at the beginning, um, two of my lab techs, Julia Rushton and, and Emily Booth, have, have just put in yeoman's work in, in running the rearing and um, maintaining my sanity and supervising an army of undergraduate techs. Um, a real big shout out to, to Lisa for her very patient guidance and uh, in helping me establish the colony and, and certainly peppering her with many, many questions in the early days of the project. Um, Rob Borchet as well has been really, really helpful uh, as well as uh, Mariana indicated. And then certainly I, uh, this project wouldn't have got off the ground without um, the funding from the the New York State Department of Transportation and uh, Christine Colley, the project manager, and, and Peter Dunley. So um, with that, uh, please save your questions to the uh, um, after talk session. Thank you so much, Dr. Dylan Perry. Uh, our final, final speaker is Robert Smith, who is the Terrestrial Restoration and Resiliency Coordinator with Slilo Prism. Robert received his Bachelor of Science and MS from SUNY ESF with a focus in forest ecology. Robert manages priority conservation areas through manual and mechanical, chemical and biological controls and advises a five county region on invasive species management and restoration. Robert will discuss the results of cage releases for Hypena opulenta that Slilo Prism monitored since 2020. Robert, we welcome you. Ooh. 
Oh, thank you, Megan, for the uh, <clears throat> for the introduction. Um, just trying to get the slides up. There we go. All right, can everybody see my screen? Yep. Oh, excellent. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Today, uh, I will talk a little bit about the uh, release of Hypena opulenta in the uh, Sulu region. Uh, Salila Prism has uh, monitored and released uh, Hypena opulenta at uh, three locations uh, with, uh, that had uh, large monocultures of uh, swallowwort. Um, we've been doing this uh, since 2018. Um, the sites that we have uh, done the uh, release and monitoring at are uh, Whaley State uh, Park, which you see down to the south from 2018 to 2021, uh, Grenadier Island just above it, uh, 2020, 2021, and Carlton Island we did in uh, 2020. Uh, the transportation that uh, we require to the islands uh, has been uh, kindly provided by uh, the Thousand Islands Land Trust and uh, residents of the islands uh, who are super enthused about uh, having these biocontrol releases occurring on the islands. So it's very easy to, uh, to get somebody to pick you up with their boat and take you over there, which is nice. Uh, each field season, uh, we uh, prepare for the arrival of the Ipina by setting up cages that will uh, hold them during the uh, monitoring stage. Uh, all these cages are placed over an area with a high abundance of swallowwort to provide the emerging uh, larvae with their food source. Uh, these cages have been set up uh, in both uh, sunny and shady locations, like I've heard all the previous presenters talking about. Um, we haven't seen a clear connection really between our success and the amount of sun. So uh, we're continuing to uh, set up uh, at uh, varied uh, sun levels. Uh, Cages uh, for this monitoring have been provided by, uh, the, by us, the Silo Prism, uh, New York uh, Invasive Species Research Institute, or NESRI, and also the USDA has provided uh, some of these cages. Uh, after setup, uh, we received the IPNA from uh, Carrie Brown Lima and Audrey Bow uh, from uh, NESRI. And prior to 2021, uh, we also received Hypena from um, Lindsay Milbrath from the USDA, who was you know, previously mentioned is no longer in the position of uh, working with Hypena. So in 2021, he wasn't able to provide them. The Hypena that uh, they provide, they come from a research lab, pretty much a University of New Hampshire a biocontrol lab, which you've already heard from. Um, the Hypena that we've received uh, since I've been doing this since uh, 2020 has been both in the uh, pupa and adult stages. A bottle of honey water solution is attached to one corner of each of the cages when we uh, place the Hypena into the cage. Uh, this will provide the adult Hypena with something to drink. Um, I actually rarely see these, uh, hy these adult hypena actually drinking from these uh, bottles of honey water. Uh, what I mostly see drinking from these bottles is ants. Lots and lots of ants. And, um, but I did catch this one. So I had to snap a picture of it so that you know, there's, I have a proof in the form of a, uh, of a photo that they will indeed drink from these uh, honey water um, bottles. Uh, monitoring occurs once a week for each cage. 
the uh, numbers of each uh, stage of development, whether it's larvae, adult, or, or pupae, and the presence of eggs are observed and recorded during the monitoring, along with uh, taking pictures and providing a, a new bottle of honey water. Uh, we have recorded uh, this information on uh, paper form in the past, like you see here on the left. Uh, but I talked to Audrey Bo this year from Nesri, and she says that we are transitioning to inputting the data to, into uh, Survey123. So, and I'm super enthused about that uh, switch to uh, going with us one super or survey one two three uh, monitoring uh, continues uh, in the cages until the larvae uh, have defoliated most of the swallowwort in the uh, cage once most of the swallowwort is defoliated we'll remove the cage to allow them to move to an air to new areas to eat more and uh, then they'll pupate Um, like I mentioned already, I've been responsible for monitoring the hypena cages since 2020, and I'm quickly going to present my results from the last two years. Uh, in uh, July 2020, we had uh, one cage set up at Grenadier Island, one at Carlton Island, and two cages at Whaley State Park. Uh, Grenadier and Carlton uh, cages were placed in uh, sunny areas, while uh, Whaley cages were placed in a uh, forested area. The, the Ipena that we received were uh, pupae and were placed in uh, buckets at a uh, whaley that had uh, lids propped up with, uh, with uh, pipes, which you can see here in the lower left picture, um, attached to the bucket. Uh, the pupae at Grenadier Island and Carleton Island were placed in uh, these uh, plastic containers that had openings in the wall to allow the emerging adults to uh, exit. These uh, containers were attached to a corner in each cage. As you can see in the graph, um, adult hypena uh, were observed at both cages at Whaley State Park in monitoring week one. Uh, the numbers then decreased in were observed in week three and increased in number in week four. Uh, numbers of larvae observed in cage one were much greater than cage two. Um, and by uh, week four, 90% uh, of the swallowwort in cage one was defoliated, uh, while 10% was defoliated in cage two. Uh, due to the large amount of defoliation in cage one, we removed the uh, cage to allow the hypena to feed outside the cage and then later pupate. We also took down uh, cage two, since we knew it had successfully produced a new generation of hypena that would potentially mate with hypena from cage one. It, um, you know, its lower numbers also um, made it uh, so that they would potentially pupate actually before they defoliated all the foliage in the cage. So it just made sense to, you know, to take down the cage, uh, both cages at the same time. Um, unfortunately, we did not observe any adult hypena e either uh, of the islands. And we did wait an additional two weeks to see if we, anything would occur, and it didn't. So we have eventually ended up removing the cages. Um, if you look at the numbers here quickly on the graph, you might say, well, this seems a little low on the numbers. It's, that, that's uh, mostly uh, the larvae, and that's due to the fact that Larvae are really hard to count uh, there, there because, uh, you know, they're uh, very small, very well camouflaged. So this is just a representative of increase and decreases in the population based on a equivalent sampling effort. Oh, every week I take a picture inside the cage from the same angle. So I can get a uh, visual measure of uh, progress. Uh, the pictures you see on the slide here are both of the inside of cage one at Whaley State Park. Um, you know, the one on the left taken, uh, you know, before any defoliation and then the one after all the defoliation was uh, done and we were about to remove the cage. And you can really see the significant impact that the hypena larvae can have on, on, on the swallower.
In uh, 2021, we decided to place uh, two cages uh, at Grenadier Island, uh, one in a sunny area and one in a forested area, instead of one on uh, Carlton and one on Grenadier Island like we did in 2020. Uh, we found that uh, other management efforts uh, were quite effective on Carlton Island. Uh, so we thought that um, the island was actually becoming less suitable for hypena establishment. Uh, so that's why we decided not to return there. Um, we again placed two cages in a forested area at Whaley State Park. On uh, June 1st, 2021, we received uh, adult hypena instead of pupae for releases. Uh, these were just simply released from containers that they used for uh, used to transport them. Unlike 2020, when we uh, released the larvae in four weeks because Ipena exhausted the supply of the swallowwort in the cage, in 2021, the numbers of larvae produced uh, from that first generation was super low, and this resulted in a low defoliation. Uh, we were concerned that releasing them from the uh, cage would result in a uh, few Ipena there um, flying off as adults uh, and for potentially to never see another hypena again in their life. Uh, you know, so they would just be little to no chance of a new generation. Uh, we thought about the uh, two generations that you've been hearing from the other presenters. Uh, since hypena hypena normally produces two generations per year up at our latitude, we decided to leave them in the cage to produce a second generation. We had never done this before, but we thought this would uh, improve the chance that mating would occur. As you can see in the graph, uh, this paid off at uh, Grenadier Island with uh, defoliation of cage one at 20% and cage two at 100% after 10 weeks. So considerably a bit longer, but I think it really paid off. Um, unfortunately, the cages at Whaley State Park, they had very, very little uh, Ipena in the first generation and they just didn't produce a second generation. Um, so we ended up taking all the cages down when that one cage was at 100% um, on August 16th. Um, all the areas are, uh, around are the cages that they're at the release sites are monitored for evidence of establishment. Um, this is conducted by Slilo Prism and Nesri at the Grenadier Island site. And Jacqueline Snur from Wells College uh, with assistance uh, from uh, Slilo Prism at Whaley State Park. So far, no evidence of establishment uh, has been found, but we hope that will change as we continue to uh, conduct releases. And uh, we do intend on doing uh, our setting up the cages again this year at uh, Whaley State Park and Greater Dare Island. All right, and that's really all I had. Thank you for your time. Um, I hope you all got something out of my uh, presentation. Thanks again. Thank you, Robert. Yeah, you're very welcome. <laughs> so before we move into the open discussion session, I'd like to invite each of you to join the ELOSC listserv. Instructions are on the screen and will also be included in your follow-up email. Resources for the ELOS can be found on the website at swallowwortcollaborative.org. The website includes pages on control and management of swallowwort, upcoming events, mapping tools, a section to post academic and practical research work, and a link with instructions on how to join our listserv. And if anybody wishes to post articles of interest or publications of your work, please email them to Robert Smith with permission to share them on the ELOSC website. We will now open the floor for open discussion session. Uh, I'm going to just go ahead and start with the questions that have been submitted so far um, in the Q&A section. So Andrew has asked, um, has anyone done studies of year after year defoliation of the same plants to see if this actually results in no or lower seed production? Their experience is that even with stem reduction every year it is rarely, if ever, seen um, seed production due to the tendency of the plant crown. 
And presenters, if you hit the Q&A um, icon on your Zoom tools, you could see the questions and feel free to answer them as you desire. So this is Mariana. Uh, so defoliation uh, that mimics the biocontrol agent feeding is one of our treatments in the restoration experiment. And again, we only done one season of defoliation, but we plan to continue it for another two or three seasons. So again, I, we don't have the data yet, but uh, it's in progress. Thank you, Mariana. And do any of the presenters want to address the second question in there? Oh, wait, no, that was the spider mites. It looks like Lindsay Milbrath answered the question about the spider mites already. Okay. All right, well then I will go ahead and ask a couple questions. Um, so this is a question for all of the presenters. What do you wish people knew about Hypena opulenta as a biocontrol for swallow work? Um, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll start off. Um, I think they need to temper their enthusiasm for it. Um, I know a lot of, a lot of outreach materials were generated in a very kind of exciting way and they're, you know, certainly in New York and, and, and Rhode Island and, and Michigan, there was, you know, a number of popular, popular articles written about it. And I think for those of us who work in biocontrol, instant success is extremely rare. Success is rare. And so, um, you know, being able to determine that it's going to do something or not going to do something is a long process. And I think people need to understand that there is not often a quick fix for an invasive plant problem. Thank you, Dr. Perry. Uh, another question in the chat box is for local governments and nature centers looking to tackle the presence of swallowwort on the property, what approach is best? So in Michigan, uh, there are some uh, nature preserves that have been spraying for 10 years. And they were, I, I talked to them and they had a very strict regimen of both like pulling plants, digging plants, spraying them twice a season. They had to maintain it for up to six, seven years before they started seeing actual results. But after 10 years, they actually seems like they are keeping on top of their swallowbird infestations. So I'm say, what I'm saying is that it's possible to eradicate them. The problem is that, you know, they invest a lot of resources to maintain this level of control. But if the neighbors have swallowbird that can repopulate their areas, it's a never ending process. And again, from the restoration experiment we started, digging out swallowbird seems to work well. And I mean, what we are doing to feed our insects, as Dylan was uh, saying, it's super difficult to rear them compared to other insects. Not super, super difficult, but the problem is to have enough foliage to feed to them. So we are restricted in our rearing to the periods when swallowbird is already growing in nature. And so that's, again, a thing that uh, Dylan mentioned that sometimes swallowbird has a two week, like uh, it emerges later uh, by two weeks, just depending on weather. And if you started your rearing, you know, in time, expecting swallowbird to come up at the time it came up last year, then you are left with lots of hungry caterpillars that you cannot feed. So we, were, we are digging out lots of plants from nature and we are doing that since 2018. And what we noticed is that where we dug out the plants to feed our insects, they didn't come back yet. And it's been four years. So the repopulation is not that fast. And again, if you have a smaller infestation on your property, if you're a private landowner, as soon as you see them, start digging them out before they get really bad. After that, it's just spraying year after year, and you have to maintain it for many, many years. Thank you, Dr. Zeus. Another question is, 
is there any evidence that the fungus might be a potential control? Is the same or a similar fungus native to the swallowwort's native range? Hi, uh, Lisa, I'll take that. So um, the Cercospora, um, or it's actually also called Passalora belleniki, which was <clears throat> identified um, for us by a mycologist um, at the USDA ARS, Lisa Castlebury, um, was, you know, it is throughout Europe and it hasn't been recorded very often here. And I think that's just because people haven't probably, you know, noticed it. Um, for myself, I think the spots have been there the whole time I've been working on swallowwort, but I think um, they mostly showed up at the end of the season and sort of appeared as part of the senescing of the plants. So um, other than that, we're still just learning. Um, when we get the leaf spot as a real serious pathogen that kills plants, um, it's only been in situations where the field is mowed in the summer. And um, because normally, you know, most of the fields we work in, they mow um, very late summer or in the fall. But if it's mowed and then we have a hot, humid summer, this is where we first noticed it in 2018, then all the young um, stems that have come up all get hit by the fungus. And it's the leaf spot first, but then we think we have some sort of downy mildew um, that comes in as well and, um, and kills the plants. Um, so to one of the questions that was asked about the fungus, um, I said, you know, those stems might be a little late for seed production anyway, but um, they certainly do not produce flowers and seeds because they're, you know, they're killed. But um, I don't see that that translates to um, plant death yet, because as, you know, people have said, you know, the root system of these plants is really, really strong. So, um, you know, it's going to take some um, work to try to figure out exactly um, what impact this pathogen has. But we're still, um, you know, kind of in the early stages. We have a graduate student starting with this to um, confirm the pathogen, confirm if it's more than one, you know, if we have a secondary uh, having an impact and, you uh, you know, it'll be good to get some information from others like Dylan and Mariana, you know, about what's going on in their areas as well. And I apologize, Megan, maybe there was one, one part of that question that I missed. I think you got it all. And I think that you answered all the other questions about the um, leaf spot fungi that were in the feed here with your response. Thank you. Okay, sure. Okay. Oh, I do have a question for Dylan. <laughs> uh, somebody else asked you about the um, two caterpillars, two larvae that you found um, that were two. You answered that it was in the third week of June and that you had only released adults. Uh, so you wouldn't have had larvae um, like that. Um, how big were the larvae? What's instar were they? Fourth instar. Fourth? Yeah. So oh, okay. they, they clearly had been feeding for some period of time, which I was like, Wow, I think maybe our release phenology may be a little late. Well, that's what, that's what in, in Rhode Island, I mean, we may need to release, you know, on May 20th or something. Yeah, uh, we're going to uh, try a much earlier release this year. Yeah. Okay. So Linda and Dylan, you know what we are trying? We always had a generation first in the lab to boost the numbers. But this year we are trying to release straight from overwintering pupa. Uh, I would thought about that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we don't know their fitness, but it's like we just don't have enough time to rear the generation before we reach the 15 hour daylight. Uh, so I know yeah. my students don't start working in the summer until about May 20th. I know. This, this, year, <laughs> this year, students can't start till the 21st of May. And I'm like, <laughs> yeah. I got to have, I, I got to have some bodies or I'm going to be rearing these things. <laughs> Hey everyone, this is uh, Rob Williams. I just uh, kind of a quick comment here. Um, I, I'm an optimist. <laughs> you, <don't sound laughs> and, uh, you know, I, 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 I just want to say that, you know, one, I'm very grateful for uh, all of you who are doing this type of research. You know, if you, if, you know, swallowwort is perhaps one of the most aggressive terrestrial invasive species I've ever uh, dealt with. So, 
knowing that we have a team of researchers such as yourselves on this um, is is humbling. And, and again, I, I, I'm an optimist. Um, so I hope that um, as we move forward, we don't get too discouraged and, and turn our attention to some other biocontrol because I think we have a, a ways to go with, with this one yet and a lot to learn. Um, and so I hope we keep, keep moving this forward. And I also would encourage, and I think Megan mentioned this, but encourage feel, you folks to feel free to post papers or, or information that you'd like to share or even presentations to the, uh, the Swallow Work Collaborative website. And you can do that just by sending it um, to Megan and then she can actually upload it to our website. Of particular interest to me is Mariana's discussion on, she's also looking at how you restore um, you know, swallow wart sites. And we do a lot of restoration work here in Eastern Lake Ontario, even on small sites, primarily with other species. We do a lot of post uh, knotweed uh, restoration and we're, we're seeing some success with it. Um, but I'm, I, this is the first I've heard of someone looking into uh, restoring uh, restoring swallow wart sites. So I'm very interested in that. And it would be, it would be great. Mariana, if, if you had some, some information that you could place on the collaborative website, and it would be nice to just kind of go to that website and say, oh yeah, here's Mariana's work and learn from it there. Thank you, Rob, uh, appreciate it. And as I mentioned, we, we just started that experiment and obviously we don't expect to see conclusive results after one season. So we def before, I don't want to mislead anybody. Again, I just have four years of experience digging the plants out and it works. But all the other, like the seeding treatments and the defoliation treatments, I would want to wait a couple more years and collecting more data before we can say anything about that. But again, it's a, I'm just lucky that I have a graduate student who wanted to do it because she's coming from a, a restoration background. Thank you, everyone. Uh, it appears that we have answered all the questions that I see in the, oh, yep, that I see in the feed here. We got lots of people thanking you, um, and I thank you again on behalf of Salilo Prism and the ELOSC for sharing your research with us here today. And as mentioned, I will be sending a follow-up email to everybody who registered. So just give me um, a thing or two to get that sent out to you, and thanks for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you for organizing. Yep. Yes, thanks a lot. And nice to see you again, Marianne and Lisa. Um, yep. Maybe nice we can have you. like a, an in-person kind of thing at some, some point. <laughs> Are you guys good. coming to the NISMA meeting? <laughs> <laughs>